Uh, hello. Well, it, um, obviously, it is a huge pleasure to be here, um, and um, I'm really impressed by the numbers of people that have um, come in on a Saturday to have this conversation. Um, uh, so just uh, as uh, Melanie said, um, I, I live in East London, I'm a, a Christian and I attend a currently attend, well, no, I'm, uh, I'm not attending anywhere now, uh, because to be honest, I don't like Zoom services, so I'm literally not attending anywhere. I don't, ugh, I can't bear that Facebook service thing. Ugh. Anyway, it doesn't suit me. Um, so, uh, but when I was, when I was attending, I was attending an Anglican church um, in the neighbourhood where I live in Forest Gate in East London. Um, I, um, I guess I will always want to start these things by saying that my um, starting point is that I am relatively new to climate. Um, I think maybe 18 months ago, I hadn't really thought about it very much. I um, mean, you know, I was aware of it like anybody is, but I hadn't really done a lot of thinking about it. And I came in um, holding tight to the tales of Greta Thunberg. Uh, and I was inspired by this amazing young woman and, and did some reading and exploring from her and then and then discovered Extinction Rebellion. And, and you know, and, and, and that's how I've come into it. So I'm not technically as... Um, as experts as, as I, I'm sure many of you are, I haven't spent loads of time doing all that reading and stuff. I've, I understand it uh, in a much more lived experience way. And I get, I should say that that's, that's my starting point. Um, and I, like everybody else here, you know, I'm deeply concerned about the, the, the challenges we face. And, and I really want to, play my part in addressing these the huge and slightly, slightly terrifying challenges um and um and i so so i've come in you know with with a kind of desire to be an activist a desire to to play my part uh, and and like everybody else kind of trying to figure out what that might mean you know what 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 does that you know how what do, how does that translate what does it actually mean to do something um about this huge and enormous issue um and so like everybody else i bring in my own um my own personal history um to this so um I mean, for all of us, you know, we come to these things bringing our whole selves. And for me, I am a, obviously a woman of colour. I am a first generation migrant. My parents migrated to this country when I was very young. I was at eight. Um, we grew up, I grew up poor in East London. Um, and these things shape how I look at the world. Um, I became a Christian as a teenager and came in um, in a in the, I became Christian in the Pentecostal tradition, but I was in, I was happened to be uh, the, the, the minister of our church was uh, understood the social implications of faith. And so I kind of came in with an understanding of that. And so I've from an early stage drawn a connection between my outrage about injustice, that kind of teenage outrage that I have held, you know, I still have absolute outrage at like how could this be you know that kind of thing um uh, and and connecting that to my faith and recognize and really knowing that you know i i uh, i am part of a tradition where justice is fundamental to that which we to all the things we believe and to the the tenets of our faith and so i come in you know with with, with carrying all that uh, and then um and then last week I, you know, I, I watched Jeremy's talk and I was like, oh my goodness, how do I follow that? It was amazing. I hope you were all here. If you were not here, I urge you to watch the YouTube, um, you know, to, to watch it. I, I watched it as a recording because I couldn't be here. I was going to see my mum. So, um, yeah. And um, so just let me start by sharing my screen um so can i do that all right so you know so as, as you remember from last week those of you who are here um so the, you know this is the global north global south thing and um the the slide on the um the with the red is uh, demonstrates uh, on the left um the right on the right demonstrates uh, the emitters and um on the left um the 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 countries that are most vulnerable and you know and he used Madagascar as a wonderful example um, of a country that produces very little CO2 emissions and is going to be horrendously affected um, and you know the just looking at 
you know, that recognition that in the end, the people that will pay the greatest price for the impact of climate change will be people who live in Africa, in uh, on the Indian subcontinent, in Afghanistan, in um, Burma, Myanmar. You know, these are these are people who have done so little to to cause the damage, and yet and have enjoyed none of the privileges that we have enjoyed, that I have enjoyed. Um, and yet will, you know, those will be uh, deeply affected. I think that, you know, that that's just such a stark and horrible realization that it does spur us to action, doesn't it? Um, and I also really appreciated his framing of climate privilege, which I hadn't thought about before. And it was just a really nice way of framing it, that thinking about, um, that the luxury of being able to think of climate change as something that's far away, that it's about coral reefs and it's about, um, you know, landscapes and polar bears, you know, this kind of, you know, the kind of slightly cutesy way of looking at climate change um, is, is the privilege of people who are not living in a country where they're facing um, so erosion, coastal erosion and drought and crop failure and competition for scarce water and all that flooding and all those things. Um, so, so picking up from that, so, you know, so that's the starting point. We know this um, and, um, and I really appreciated how he framed it. The other thing that he did was his talk about institutional racism, which again, I, I mean, I'm using a different set of images, but, um, you know, he, the, the, the way he separated personal racism, individual racism with institutional and systemic racism. Um, and, and I think that thing of being able to say, to say that a, uh, a system is racist is not to say every single individual within that is going around um, harassing people of color. You know, it was just, and I realized when I listened to him that I thought, well, actually we don't say as, as clearly as that often enough. When, when Stormzy said this country was 100% racist in an interview a year ago, um, or, or maybe it was why, I don't know. Um, you know, he, he, he faced incredible um, hostility in the media because journalists read that as he was saying they were personally racist which is just this, and I think institutional racism is hard to understand um, oh, if you haven't spent some time thinking about it. It's not an instinctive, um, it's not instinctively understood uh, given the education that people have. And so just to recap that, you know, institutional racism is a collective failure um, of the way that organizations work together to exclude certain groups. Um, because, and in terms of racism, we say it's because of people's color, their, um, their, their ethnicity, their background. Um, and, and, you know, structural racism is when these things are, so institutional racism is when an organization does, and Metropolitan Police has been found time and again, and at one stage admitted that it was institutionally racist, because the results of, of actions that, that was happening within that, that organization was, en ends up in, black communities and communities of color having a very different experience of the Metropolitan Police than white communities. Um, so that's an institutional racism. And systemic racism is the way these things interconnect, how the educational system and the criminal justice system and the housing system interconnect. Um, and, and it's kind of like the water we swim in. You know, that's the institutional racism. Again, not individual racist, but institutional racism. That's just recapping the stuff that Jeremy said. And I guess for me, this was the um, the um, the COVID nineteen example example. My goodness, that which we are living through has been an extraordinary case study of structural racism. I mean, the starkness of this is so shocking that we have lived through. We are living through a time when we are facing this extraordinary extraordinary crisis where people's lives are literally vulnerable people are fearful for their lives um and yet the people that that people of color are disproportionately impacted and when the data first came out in may um there was a lot of kind of why is this is it because people of color are not uh, that we don't social distance well it was before so we weren't using the phrase social distancing quite the way then that we were now but there was stuff about people not uh, that, that people living more communally 
that people that um, uh, ethnic minority communities, community, black communities, communities of color, um, are, are you know go are, are not uh, are not staying away from each other in the way the rest of the culture was. And it was like it's because of the way we live. That's why we're dying. It's choices that we are making. And of course, you know, and and but the reality is, it's it's an inter interface between poverty and housing and service sector jobs poorly paid jobs and people not being able to afford to not go to work and people not having the luxury of working from home and, you know and lots of other things so it's like it's this kind of whole mess of stuff which has ended up with us visibly seeing that people of color black people are experienced you know die far are dying at a greater rate and i just feel like we don't need to explain institutional racism. We won't need to explain it in the same way in 2021 as we did in 2020, because we will all have lived through it. You know, we have seen how it works out. And obviously in the States, that's really playing out now. I mean, it's awful, but I don't want to think about the States. Um, and then, then I moved to kind of our own movement. I mean, the re my contention is that thinking about institutional racism and you know and the way diversity plays out in our movement you know i'm part of this you know in our movement you know we have to say that the picture at the top is much more common than the picture at the bottom <laughs> you know the picture at the bottom does exist thank goodness you know it is not so this is not an this is not a white movement i, I you know melanie and i and all of us the many of us here are here to contend and say it is not a white movement there are many people of color within their movement but it has but the, but it, it is propon, you know, the dominance is white, that the people making the judgments, the framing, the, who are leading our movement are white. And as a result, it, it, not through any individual racist intentions, but the way it plays out has been that it, 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 it ends up that voices of color are marginalized, experiences of color are marginalized, and therefore people of color do not are not participating in the ways that we in, in the numbers or the volumes or the ways that um, that uh, um, an equal and more equal organization institution set of movements would have. So you know it's the it's the water we're swimming in. You know it's like it's just we're all part of this, and um, our, the culture our movement was born in has meant that it, it speaks to and connects with white people, middle class people more effectively than it speaks to and connects to people of color and to working class people. I don't think that's particularly contentious. I think that that's kind of understood now and there's lots of conversations about that. Um, and I guess I come in saying, well, what can we do about this? You know, I was really appreciative of what Jeremy said. I think it was really, really helpful. It was a framing. And I guess I come in and going, yep, absolutely. And now what are we going to do about it? Because me, I'm a doer. I'm an activist. I want to I want to change things. And I, but I, I absolutely know that we need to understand in order to change. So now that we have that understanding, what do we do? So I suppose, oh, yeah, this is... Um, I suppose what I'm, oh, let me go back one. So I suppose what I say is that the enormity of the climate challenge needs all of us. We are not going to address this issue if only some people participate. So if it continues to be white middle-class people leading this and, and, and dominating the movement, it will, it will not succeed. How can it? If it excludes large numbers of people, it cannot succeed. We need everybody. The scale of the task is so vast that we need everybody. We need all groups to come in. And, um, you know, people will come in at different levels, but we, we just you need to, it's going to take all of us. And my, um, and I guess I have been invited several times to, to groups and to, to, to events and stuff to help organizations, predominantly, predominantly white organizations, to think about how can they do better to engage black people, Asian people, people of color. I'm sure all of you who are in the movement, who are of color, have been in those conversations where we, we are brought in or we are part of a conversation where we all scratch our heads and go, oh, what can we do? There are just not enough there's not enough diversity in our group. What shall we, what can we do? How can we engage them better? 
And I resist that now. Oh, I mean, I, I've joined in those conversations. So, you know, I, I want to say absolutely, I'm, I'm not standing above any of this. I am in it with all of us. We're all doing it and I'm doing it with you. So I've been in those conversations, but now I'm thinking, actually, I'm not sure it's about engagement. Engagement speaks of we, the climate movement, need to go out there and bring people of colour into our movement. That's what engagement speaks. That's, that's the kind of picture I have in my head. Um, and I think that actually it's about the movement shifting its focus. I don't think it's about us saying, let's go bring in some black people, some Asian people, some working class people. Let's go get them in. Let's get out there and bring them in. I, I mean, we've tried that and it's not working that brilliantly. Um, and um, in the main, I think that we need to change our movement. We need to change the way we define, frame, discuss these issues. So, um, and rather than the movement, so I think that the movement needs to shift its focus to center on those issues and those priorities that people of color and working class people care about. So while we don't, if we don't connect with issues that, 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 um, that matter to them, they will not join in any sort of numbers. So there's, um, Jeremy talked about, you know, abstract ideas, you know, no, it wasn't, it was, uh, th there's been some research done that, you know, abstract ideas of uh, a tendency to, set, to focus on technical scientific language, a focus on ecology does not connect beyond the white middle class bubble that already in it. That in some ways, what we need, well, in every way, I think what we need to do is to think again about what the priorities, what, what are the priorities that we could connect with? How could we frame our movement so that it, 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 it actually speaks to priorities that those, that those communities already have? And so, which is what this picture of, um, Rosamond Kissy Debra is. So Rosamond Kissy Debra is the mother of a, of a child who died as a result of asthma. This is her, 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 one, a smiling image where she just won a case um, or a step in her, like, um, um, in her uh, battle. Um, and so essentially her daughter died and, um, of asthma related complications. And they, she lives in Lewisham. Her daughter grew up in Lewisham. And she was 13 years old when she died. Um, and she has been campaigning about air pollution oh, yeah. in really powerful ways. To be honest, she's pretty much on her own. There isn't a movement around her. Um, and this woman is campaigning on issues that we understand. She's campaigning on air pollution. But, she do, but she's starting from it. Of, uh, she, her starting point is lived experience. And is very much about the old camp, about the streets and the um, the community, the urban inner city community that she lives in, which the council has, you know, again, there was, there's another coroner thing going on at the moment. And, you know, the council is being taken to court over the fact that they should have done more. Now, whether, you know, and, and so this is an issue air pollution i live in, in in east london and air pollution gets people i've done we've done outreach events i've talked to people i've done you know we've done things where we've we've talked to people and people understand everyday folk understand air pollution now because asthma rates in our communities are really really high people get it so i guess if we if if we if we started to engage on these issues that would help um the other things are the ways in which climate is affecting our communities in this country now. You know, the, the, the this is, I think, Doncaster. Um, but, you know, people are experiencing climate change now in the UK. Oh, how do we stand with that? How do we engage with that and start to talk about climate change? from their perspectives, by centering their stories and experiences, by, by thinking about framing it in the way they would frame it, rather than the way that we would frame it, because they do frame it differently. Um, and um, 
and then and and I guess the, the, this slide is um I've been doing some some work in like many of you I'm part of a number of groups and one of the groups that I've been doing some stuff with is Green New Deal UK small young started a year ago I think um and what they have been doing is at the Green New Deal UK's kind of um starting point is that, that we have an inequality crisis as well as a climate crisis and the two need to be dealt with together so um a really interesting hypothesis um and um and they have been campaign they've been uh, joining with other people's campaigns so they've they've joined with london renters union because that london rent because like, although that's not a directly climate thing it's about inequality and instead of going to say to their to london renters union can you come and help us with our campaign green new deal uk has been partnering with london renters union about their campaign showing solidarity and saying the the world that we want to create is one of of justice and equality and talking to the london renters union about about green stuff because that's what when we come into rooms that's what we that's the badge we wear but actually uh, the support that that has been given to that organization has been standing in solidarity Similarly, Gatwick, this is really interesting, that instead of campaigning against Gatwick, which we have all, you know, you know, I mean, there's there's space for that, but the stance that they've just taken, this I think was this month, um, the stance taking here is saying, actually, the people that work in Gatwick, work in airports, need new jobs. So instead of us positioning ourselves against those people and saying, you are working in a, horrible carbon producing industry to stand with those people and saying we know that you need jobs we know that the 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 world that we want to create is one in which there will be better jobs for everybody and there will be sustainable jobs and jobs that contribute so i mean it's just an example it's not the only way to do it but i thought it was an interesting example the thing that, um, as Melanie said, the thing that I have been doing is um, working with Christian Aid um, to think about um, how black majority churches could get involved in climate discussions. And so over the summer, Christian Aid um, worked with a, a, a Cervantes, a, a big research company uh, like Ipsos Mori, it wasn't Ipsos Mori, but that kind of organization to do a, a survey of black Christians. And this is what they found. Um, and so, the, you know, the recognition that, that they um, they do that black Christians do feel informed. They understand that earth, uh, that care for the earth is a Christian command, and they know they absolutely know that people of color are more are disproportionately affected. The um, half of that uh, those surveyed said that they would get more involved. You know, they're interested in getting more involved. Um, and a quarter are saying they don't want to be involved primarily because they don't they don't see how it connects with their lives and they don't know anybody that's involved so like it's just worth knowing if we want to bring black christians in this is really interesting insights and what i have been doing is i've been thinking about how, how can we communicate the stories of Black church, a black Christian's experience of climate. So we know that there are black Christians who are passionate about climate. Of course, there are. There are, in, in, as in every other community, there are people who are passionate about climate. Like, uh, and what I'm really interested in is is trying to do that thing of saying, you know, where they say they don't know, they feel no connection to the movement, and they don't know anyone involved. How do we tackle that? How can we? Uh, so I'm interested in that space. And what I've been doing has been I, I is that I did some interviews with a half a dozen Christian leaders of color and we are producing those as a set of storybooks which I think will be done by January um, and what I did was I interviewed people to say what how did you get in how did you get involved what what brought you into the climate movement and I think uh, I've just pulled up three here because of time um, but I think it's really interesting to see how people frame it differently. So this is Reverend Mallet, she's an Anglican bishop, Anglican archdeacon, um, and she came to it through this understanding of global capitalism, um, about seeing 
Senegal, in tom uh, tomatoes in Senegal used to be abundant. And then suddenly the cheap Spanish tomatoes are brought in and that destroyed that whole economy. So just the way capitalism works has been really part of why she is interested in climate. Um, and that Ken Sarawiwa, who was, you know, this climate activist who was murdered by, by the state and, you know, with all sorts of other multinationals involved, we think. Reverend Alton Bell, um, I mean, uh, uh, Reverend Bell's um, experiences, he really connects it to en uh, enslavement and how, and this is connects to things that Jeremy was saying last week, the rewards from enslavement fuel the industrial re revolution, putting the great into Britain. The proceeds from slavery and colonialism built an infrastructure in this country, which colonized India, Africa, Asia, and by extracting the resources from those places, we were able, they, this country was able to develop steam trains, industry, et cetera. So, you know, that, that the thing that Jeremy touched on last week, which is that, you know, the connection that um, the way our wealth in this country, all that we enjoy is so connected to, ensla to, to enslaved people, and that that is so connected to carbon emissions, you know, exploitation of the earth, all that stuff, really interesting. And then the last one I'm going to share with you is Gideon, who's an activist in Ghana. Um, and, you know, he has, he tells a story about, see, about sanitation, about waste management and coastal erosion. So he came to it seeing what, you know, how, um, coastal erosion swept away local homes and as an active Christian he he has this real thing that you know that the bible speaks of creation care and that African traditional African beliefs speak of Christian of, of creation care and that when the missionaries arrived they said to the Africans your your practice the traditional practices of not fishing on Tuesdays, of, of leaving the land fallow, that, you know, that those traditional practices were, were jettisoned as, as being, anyway, as not being Christian. And so, you know, the kind of, along with the, the missionaries came a kind of a whole world view about how we treat the planet. So I, my, I'm going to end by saying to you, my, um, my, my ask of you is to talk to the people of colour and working class, the people that are not typical climate activists, um, as, as the movement currently stands, you know, and to, and to hear their stories and to understand those stories and to try and find ways of amplifying those stories. Because I think we need to be able to demonstrate that not everybody in who's interested in climate came to it because they watched David Attenborough documentaries, moving though those are for so many climate activists, that's their story. You know, they started by, I used to watch those documentaries. I love, you know, the, the story about the animals and the natural world. And that's why I came, and that's a very dominant story, but that's not the only story. And we need to start on um, shedding light on and, um, and, and elevating these other stories. That's all I'm going to say. Have I overrun? I have.